time trying to catch this guy. There's a moth in my hands and I'm just gonna let it outside before it gets caught by spider webs. Okay, time number four. Okay, go out this way. There you go. <laughs> well, it's another windy day here on the Isle of Man and we're at the home garden. And I've not shown you around in some time. So today what I'm going to be doing is give you an update as to what's going on here in the greenhouse, out here in the back garden. I also have a birthday present to myself that's gonna be happening out here very soon. And then also in my last video, I asked you to be sending me postcards with your questions for today's Q and A video. And I've got a few here and I'm delighted to be able to share them with you and also to answer those questions. But first, what's going on here in the greenhouse? If you recall, I started off the year with a growing tomatoes from seed series that I actually ended because I ran into a major issue. My small plants that I planted out here in the greenhouse were failing to thrive. They had some strange leaves that were curling inwards. And I did a bit of research and I was absolutely shocked to learn that people have been having problems with purchased compost and that a lot of it has been contaminated with a type of herbicide, so a aminopyrrolid herbicide. I'm fairly certain that mine were as well, but I gave them some TLC and allowed them to continue growing and I just wanted to see what happened. Now this tomato is one of the black Russians and as you can see it grew very, very deformed and I've seen quite a few deformed fruits so far. Not the majority, but quite a few. And this one has been ripening in a strange way as well. So this side is all red. This side has not ripened and you can see there's lots of mold. So after this video, I'm gonna cut this off and dispose of it. But there are plenty of other tomatoes that look perfectly normal, like this one here albeit green. There's plenty more over here. The Costa Luto Forentinos. They've been looking quite interesting. The Ailsa Craigs. They're big and green up here. And I just noticed that we've got some ripening happening in this Costa Luto Forentino. They're kind of weird looking tomatoes, but apparently they taste great. It has been kind of, kind of a dilemma deciding, am I going to eat these or not? And I'm gonna say right now, probably. So <laughs> if you don't see any videos from me for a while, uh, raise the alarm. <laughs> no, just kidding. I'm sure I'll be fine. But I am quite disappointed with my tomatoes this year because of that experience and I'm very wary of compost now but the thing is is that here on the Isle of Man I've got limited choice so it's all quite a conundrum. That was quite a lesson so I think this next year I'll be using a lot more homemade compost for things like seed sowing and small plants because it's just not possible for me to get a hold of the really good soil association approved compost here it's just too expensive bringing it across the Irish Sea. But on a more positive note, the tomatoes did recover in the end. Um, and yeah, we'll see, we'll see how they go. First postcard. So this is from Tegan in Oxford. And there's a question dealing specifically with tomatoes. In your tomato series, you plant the seedlings on a few times. Why not just plant the seeds directly into the final pots and save some work? I think that that's a really good question and it's one that a lot of people probably ask themselves. And the answer is that each time you pot on that little seedling, you can plant it deeper because the stem will actually produce more roots that will go out laterally. So in that way, you can build a stronger plant with a much deeper root system that's able to survive droughts, to gather more water, to be more sturdy and solid in the grounds. And so that's the reason that you pot on. While we're in the greenhouse, let's have a look at what else is growing. 
So first of all, I have a couple of aubergines in pots here, and this is a variety called Mitoyo. And it's a dwarf variety, so it doesn't really need that much support. And I've gotten a, a couple of fruit off of them already. They're quite a bit smaller and more oval. This one's about halfway finished growing. There are two tomatoes in grow bags here. And I think there were a couple of people that weren't quite sure if they would grow in such a small container of soil, but as you can see, they are doing just fine. This is a really standard way for people to grow tomatoes here in Britain. And it's not organic, it's not completely natural, but it does work. And as you can see, there's loads of the sun gold tomatoes there. And there's loads of Ailsa Craig's over here. Look at all of those tomatoes. Next to this pot of coriander is a cucumber. And it's a variety called Delhi Star. And it has green, like light green skinned cucumbers like that. That one's ready to be picked. And we've been picking quite a few off of it already. And as we head up the vine, which I've trained around a string, you'll see even more cucumbers forming. And as we get up a little bit higher, we'll even see some flowers. This next postcard comes from Veronica in Slovakia. And she asks, Dear Tanya, if you had no allotment or garden and your growing space was limited to a large window box, what would you grow in it and why? Now, you can grow a lot in containers. Most things will grow in containers, uh, but they do prefer having a little bit more room to grow for the most part, most things. However, window boxes are great for things like trailing nasturtiums, also Mediterranean herbs that you can grow while they're still quite small. You can keep them constrained and they'll go for ages. Thyme, rosemary, sage and these have a lot of value because you can nip out and use them in cooking all the time for flavor you don't need too much to get that impact and also they're drought tolerant because window boxes need a lot of watering they can dry out really quickly so growing things that can withstand a little bit of drought is probably the way forward for me Do you remember when we first moved in here and I built this planter? I did a video for it actually, and now look at it, just totally filled. This is a small fruit tree. So this is, I believe that's the pear. And then over here, there's an apple as well. And Chibi's just keeps on wanting to make herself known. That is quite a stretch. <laughs> So back to the planters. I've got calendula in here as well, some alpine strawberries, dahlias. At the back there, I have a few tomatoes. I did chance growing them outside this year, and that is a type that uh, Thompson and Morgan sent me. It was an experimental type. I don't think that they'll actually ripen, but I did notice there were some fruits forming back there. Let's see if we can just make them out here. So we'll see, we'll see. And speaking of Mediterranean herbs, I've got rosemary, a massive sage. That is just one plant, guys. I planted that earlier this year. My nasturtiums, thyme, two types of thyme actually. And they've been doing great in this planter. Now this is so cute. Someone from the Isle of Man actually sent me a postcard. And this is Chris. And Chris asks, as you know, our weather can be quite cool and wet. I have a hard time getting my plant seeds started. What are your top three recommendations for growing in our climate? So first of all, greenhouse. So if, we, if you have a cool climate or it's inclement in any way, it's better to grow under cover in something that you can control a bit better. If I had a lot more space, I would have a polytunnel like some of my friends because those are just incredible spaces. So number one, greenhouse. Number two, I start off almost all of my seeds in modules first. I don't tend to direct sow them. There are exceptions to that rule, but 
sewing things in modules first will give you a chance to monitor them in a place like a greenhouse or in your home or in a conservatory and then get them going that way. My third tip for growing in our climate is to grow realistic varieties. I've had quite a few people start up at our allotment garden from various places that have warmer climates and it's their hope and dream to grow a lot of the same things that they grew in Eastern Europe, France, Southern Europe and growing tomatoes outdoors here is very, very iffy at best. Sweet corn, peppers, I mean, even main crop potatoes will get blights. So it's being realistic with what you're going to grow. Grow things that are going to be a sure thing. So spinach, early potatoes, beets and carrots, cabbage. The cabbage family do brilliantly here on the Isle of Man. And once you have those down, experiment like I do with lots of other things so that if you have a failure, it's not really going to make any difference because you've got those staples nearby as well. It's been slow getting very much done here, but I have been successfully growing in the raised beds. The sweet peas are pretty much over. I mean, they're still blooming but they have powdery mildew on them. So when I get back, I'm going to have to take them down. But they've been such a joy this year. This is the favorite, or my favorite. And isn't that color variation just stunning? And there's purple ones in here, and magenta. Down here, this big mass of what looks like clovers. This is oka. It's also called New Zealand yam and it's all foliage at the moment. It will only start forming tubers in the late autumn and hiding under the edge there. We've got some beetroot and we've been eating quite a lot of beetroot recently. It's done very well. This is a chioga, so it's that, it's also called, called candy cane, I believe, beets. And it loves our climate. We have a really mild summer, so it uh, does very well here. Down here at the end, this is my one courgette plant, zucchini, and this is the sure thing. So this came in, in that seed order that I did with Thompson and Morgan that you helped me choose seeds for. And you can see that there's a couple of little baby ones that I'm going to have to pick before we head off. And I'm sure there'll be some massive ones waiting for us when we come home. The next question is from Jacqueline in Wiltshire, and she says, why do my beetroot always end up like miniature carrots? Now with Jacqueline being in probably a very similar climate as far as temperatures to me, I would say that she probably isn't dealing with a hot summer. I might be wrong though. Wiltshire might have much warmer summers than the Isle of Man. So if you grow beetroot in the summertime when it's really hot, really dry, beetroot can fail to thrive and it, they can fail to do anything other than to sulk and stay small um, and basically look like miniature carrots. So my guess is maybe that it might be down to watering, that they're just too dry, but it could be something else as well. It's hard to say. So we have been, or I should rather say Josh, has been cutting the grass back here all summer long and he's fed up and I'm fed up with how it looks as well. And I'm a big supporter of having paths around your raised beds. It just saves so much time. I have the wood chip paths in the allotment garden. So what I have decided to do is to put in lovely pebble paths all up here so that it will go all the way up to the greenhouse and then it will go around each of the four raised beds. And it, it's a really lovely pebble. It's called Autumn Gold, so hopefully it'll add a little bit of warmth back here as well and make it so much more low maintenance. Last year I grew the purple spreading broccoli in the allotment garden and this year I've planted it here in this raised bed. And I've been battling with the um, cabbage white butterfly 
because it keeps coming close to the net to where the leaves are brushing against, laying its eggs, and that's why there are so many holes in these leaves here. I thought it was protected and then when I looked closer, there were all of these caterpillars, which hopefully I've all managed to find and remove. Let's just say remove. <laughs> we won't go into details. And I've asked my friend to keep an eye on it, but fingers crossed that there aren't any caterpillars left to decimate. I'm just having a one last look to see if I see anything. If you see any caterpillars, let me know in a comment. Over here, I've got a couple of rows of beetroot. And these are an autumn crop, spring crop. And here on the Isle of Man, there's summer crop too, because it is quite mild. And then there's some rocket down here as well. This far raised bed gets very little sun, but I've been successfully growing lettuce and other leafy greens in here all summer long and I've just planted it up with some more. Let's have a look to see how these guys are doing. So we've got some spinach in here, various lettuces, and they're all growing under cover. And I see a couple of the lettuces haven't made it, but lots have. What are you doing? No. <laughs> Mischief. All right. No. Go. <laughs> uh, it's quite a bit warmer in here. It's quite nice. So hopefully these guys will keep nice and cozy and will escape the slugs while I'm away. Sarah from the Yorkshire Dales has a few questions. And uh, I'll, let's answer the first one. She asks, what do you do with your produce aside from eating fresh? Do you can, ferment, pickle things as well as your medicinal body products? Yeah, when I have extra, I will do. Um, I tend to freeze a lot of things just because it's easier. I do make jams um, or jellies every year. Uh, I will do pickles. It really comes down to what I have and also if I have time. And by far the easiest thing for me to do is freeze things. And sometimes I blanch things like green beans beforehand, but things just go in the freezer. So I, I've tried actually freezing purple sprouting broccoli this year, and I would actually recommend not doing that because it's all fallen apart all over my freezer. So that's a lesson learned, but a lot of other things can be frozen, including fruit. I grow a lot of soft fruit as well. And when we don't eat it immediately, I try to pop it in the freezer as well. Now, I never really take you guys back here because it's not really the prettiest. I've got a couple of composters, my wormery, wheelbarrow and stuff over here. But what I wanted to show you was the log. So it really hasn't done much. So if you're wondering, have I gotten any mushrooms off of it? The answer is no. <laughs> and it might be because the log is just so freaking big. It might actually take years is what I found out afterwards. So you traditionally would use a log about this size. And I've actually planted some of those mushroom spores inside this one. And I have it elevated, but I haven't seen any signs out of this one either. But don't worry, when I start seeing mushrooms, I will let you know. Now, the last postcard that I received was actually a parcel. It was the most thoughtful thing. Now, her question was actually interesting, and I think it's happened to a lot of people. And she sent me a photo, actually. And she said that she grew three different types of, of potatoes this year. So she's got Aaron Pilot, Charlotte. So these are two very standard ones here in Britain. And then she's also grown this one over here called Inca Bella. And these are the potatoes, I imagine, as she, she purchased them. So these ones are the ones that she planted. Now, the problem is, is that she's dug them all up and they're all marble sized or uh, she said the size of two of your thumbs put together, there's a few that are that big, but not many, but they're all just really tiny. And she's wondering what's, what's going on and if I know anything more about it. Now, I've never grown Inca Bella, but I just did a little bit of research and Inca Bella needs a really long growing period. And 
the actual recommendation is to plant them in March and not to lift them until the end of September. So I've received this at the end of August. So I'm not sure when you actually dug them up, but it was at least a month too soon. And you might have planted them a bit later, not sure. So if you're gonna grow the variety again, get them started early. You might wanna consider chitting them, get them in the ground and then leave them there to grow for as long as you can. So as far as the home garden and the allotment garden are concerned, I'm going to be going on this holiday for a couple of weeks. They're going to be taken care of. When I get back, I'm going to be doing some cleanup work at the allotment garden, getting it ready for winter. There's a lot of things still growing there. I was there this morning picking raspberries. They're massive and delicious, and I'm sure there's going to be plenty when I get back as well. And I'll be putting that to bed very soon. And then the home garden over the winter, obviously the pebble pathways are gonna go in next. And then I'm going to finish up with some nice looking beds towards the front. So where the sunflowers are at the moment, I'm going to be making that a proper bed with edging and on the other side as well. And we're getting there slowly but surely, it's taking form. Uh, but I'm also looking forward to a little bit of quieter non-gardening time over the winter because I, I can't, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm absolutely exhausted. The last couple of months have been some of the busiest as far as work has been concerned ever for me. Um, the Gardener's World feature, which was amazing, it really made my business take off and I've been spending a lot of time making soap and, and fulfilling orders and things like that. And Christmas is coming up, so that's going to be busy for me as well but I've got plans for next year and we're getting all of my ducks in a row just to make sure that I get to spend time in my beloved gardens and be able to share them with you as well. So thank you again. I'm off in Switzerland. I'm trying to detox a little bit, but I will obviously be online. There may be a video next week. I'm not gonna promise it though because I really would like some time off, but if not, There'll definitely be one in a couple of weeks and I will be sharing some of my trip with you in the next video and I think that you're going to be amazed at how beautiful Switzerland is because although I've not been there yet the pictures are just incredible and we're going to be spending some time in some very special places. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye for now.